We live in a world that sort of says, this is what you need to do to be successful. You need to step out of that thinking. I think you need to sort of say, what is it that's important to me? Where, where is my passion? Like, what do I get excited about in life? And that's really ties to your sense of purpose, which really guides you forward. But then how do I create that skill base? How do I develop those protective factors, the resilience, the performance skills that allow me then to step out into things I normally wouldn't have done and actually see fear as an indicator that that's probably something I should try because it's the right thing to do. May not want to do it, but that's called courage. Right on. And uh, yeah, so I think the goal of life is to flourish and, uh, that, and, and that, that's a journey. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Flourish Podcast. And we're so excited to have with us here today, Dr. Wayne Hammond. And Dr. Wayne is uh, our interview guest for today. He's a great friend. But what you're going to discover as he shares is he's a great person with so much to share that can benefit so many people. So Dr. Wayne, welcome. It's my pleasure Hey, to be here. So good to have you here. And this is in our, our Calgary studio. So Dr. Wayne, why don't you just tell the audience, if you don't mind, just a little bit about yourself, like your background, uh, what made you, you. Right. Well, it's been a journey, I know, but I'm probably going to give my age away. It's, <laughs> it's, it's been a longer journey than I thought. Um, you know, my, my background's a clinical psychologist, and so I was really intrigued uh, through my educational process about how people think, how they work, interact with each other. Okay. Um, but it almost, in many ways, where I'm at in life now has been a reflection of sort of what I experienced. Okay. Um, I know during my high school years, I was not exactly one of those stellar students. You know, I, uh, they probably saw me more as a behavioral issue as opposed to, uh, you know, this, this kid's going to walk the end of the stage <laughs> at the end of the year uh, and get an honors roll thing. Um, walking the plank rather yeah, than the stage. Plank, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't all that passionate about going to school because I didn't find it meaningful. I also felt like the education system wasn't connecting me with the way that I learned. Okay. The way I experienced life. So huh. used to look out the window a lot. Think, You're a daydreamer. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm a reflective person. <laughs> right. But uh, so, um, you know, I, actually, I didn't really do well at school. So I, um, you know, was thinking about maybe going on to college, university, but I didn't have the marks. I couldn't get in. So okay. I had to work for a period of time, about seven or eight years. And then eventually okay. I figured out, hey, <laughs> maybe this isn't where I want to go. Maybe I can think. And I went to the University of Western Ontario and wrote their entrance exam and got 10 out of 100. Oh, uh, you know, okay. it was kind of like, no, you're not our kind of student. And, uh, but there was a professor there that sort of said, Hey, Wayne, I actually think you know how to think. You just don't know how to read and write. You don't know how to communicate. Huh. And so he sat down with me and spent some time for about six to eight months and taught me the English language. And wow. then I went back to school and got a 4.0 for the like next 14 years of my life. Hmm. So what I learned from that whole process is that, you know, people want to be valued. People have aspirations. People can do things if people come along and help them to really discover what their greatness is, what their strengths are, and apply those strengths in positive ways to how they're navigating life. And so in my clinical practice, I was taught at the very beginning, you know, when people experience challenges, we have a tendency to come in and sort of say, well, this is what's wrong with you. This is what you need to change, and therefore you'll be a good person or you'll experience life. And it didn't really fit for me how what I was experiencing with people in my practice because what I feel, realized that people actually don't want to be fixed. They want to be valued. They want to have somebody who will come along and say, you know something, I get it because I've had a life experience and you're having a life experience and we're really not that different. So I'm not the expert here, but I am going to facilitate a way that you're going to explore what is amazing about you because you don't know it yet. And then let's practice that. And so that gave me that switch from focusing on what's wrong with people to what's right. And so I've been embracing for the last 20 years this idea that um, people are all trying to meet their needs. But in many cases, they don't know what strengths to draw upon or they don't know mm. what experiences to pull into it. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, it's not about trying to manage their behavior, like stop drinking and therefore you're a good father right. concept. Rather, it's, you know, what need are you meeting? Yeah. And can we identify that? And then what would be the strengths you would need in order to meet that need in a positive way? Right. Therefore, the behavior looks after itself. Okay. So it's more of a facilitating process. It's almost like a coaching process right. of how do we help people explore things, step out of their comfort zones, try things they've never done before. Because that's what life is about. Life is a continuous journey of trying things that we've never done before 
And those aha moments of, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. Now I know how to practice it. So what I learned yesterday, mm -hmm. I use for today. What I learned today, I'm using for tomorrow. Right. And it's that just continuous journey of evolving who we are. Nice. So what, uh, and thank you for that. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, paths I'd love to, to go down, but maybe to start, like, what do you feel is happening right now in our education system? And this isn't... Um, in any way intended to be a, a soapbox of criticism because my observation is there's a lot of people who feel the way you did and that is you know uh, maybe the problem is me like maybe the system is is showing me that i'm inadequate or i'm a failure but really the system is not working for a lot of people mm -hmm. and i again i wouldn't even blame i wouldn't blame the teachers for that i think that often they themselves feel in some senses that they're a victim of that system. And so what, you know, what do you feel is happening uh, in our education system and, and what do you feel could be done to, to improve it? Uh, talk about a big question. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. So how do you turn the Titanic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in three days. That's right. Yeah. Well, I, I think the we don't even have three days. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Only 20 minutes for this podcast here, right? Yeah. Like uh, to me, um, traditional education has put a lot, a lot of emphasis on, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to do. Therefore, perform. Okay. That's kind of the approach that we take. We put a lot of emphasis on children knowing something. And if we think that if they know something, then they should naturally respond a certain way. Um, and it's, you know, even the fact that we have classrooms with long rows and the teacher at the front, it's sort of uh, based on pedagogy and here's the information you need mm -hmm. and repeat it enough, you should be able to memorize it. Well, we know that the education system that we have only appeals to about 40% of the students who okay. have a cognitive learning style that way. Hmm. The other 60 students, 60% 60 of the students have a different learning style. Hmm. And so I think in many ways, education is starting to get it because they're taking a look at the results. They're taking a look at, hey, we, you know, in many of the provinces across Canada, we lose 30% of our students before grade 10. Wow. Because they're frustrated and they get to grade 10, they turn 16, hey, I can get out of here. Yeah. I can make a choice. Yeah. And then we even also have those kids who graduate and do well academically on the surface, make the criteria for going on to college and university, and then we lose 40% of them in the first two years of, of, of post-secondary education because they don't know how to thrive. Wow. Hey, I'm in, a, I'm in a room with my roommate, and my roommate snores. I'm going back home. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. the simple things. And I've got friends who head up counseling departments in universities across Canada, and they're saying, we're overwhelmed, Wayne. Yeah. But we're not talking to people who are severely addressing uh, a counseling concern. Mm -hmm. we're, they just don't know how to navigate life. Life, yeah. So I think in many ways, education has got to shift. It's got to shift to sort of saying, um, uh, it's almost a shift in their belief system. Okay. It's more about, hey, it's not about what you know, it's have we actually prepared you to be a learner. Right. And therefore, how do we get there? Hmm. Uh, China, or no, Japan and Norway, um, I've actually now decided not to do testing up until grade six. Okay. They're focusing primarily on, what does that child experience when they come into our school? Right. Do they feel valued? Do they have relationship? Do they feel like they actually are connecting to our teachers in a way that they are allowed to be curious, to ask questions, to engage in a process that uh, actually then facilitates learning okay. in unique ways? So the paradigm shift has got to move away from knowing something to actually creating a culture where kids are given permission to explore, to be right. curious, right. and to reflect on what they're learning right. and how do I learn. And so a lot of it is more, uh, and I know you've used this language before, of an, of an inside-out approach rather than outside-in. Right. And for a lot of people, like I, I, I think for the average teacher who has expertise maybe in teaching arithmetic or reading or writing or science or history or whatever it is, but, but, but how much education do they get in helping a person to really self-discover mm -hmm. and lean into who I am? And so... I would, you know, like if, if you were educating teachers, what would be some of the things that, that would be really helpful for them or helping teachers? Because if I think actually the teachers I've talked to, they're like, man, super passionate. They would love to be doing that. Right. And, and yeah, the math stuff and all of that too, of course. But, but it's sort of like I need a toolkit, especially because so many people come from broken or dysfunctional homes where they don't have that toolkit and the teachers now have such complex environments, right? Yeah, you're right. I think when I talk to a lot of teachers, they're not receiving this education in their certification process to become a teacher. Right. It's very much on a lot of the 
structured expectations that education has for results. You know, we're okay. going to test all our kids at a reading level by grade three or grade seven. Right. You know, how are they doing on the, you know, the stats courses for qualifying for post-secondary? I think in many ways it's a, um, I, I go back to this idea of strength-based practice or positive psychology. Okay. Because this is a, a it, it shifts the belief system that we have of how we work with students. Uh, my belief is, is that every student's amazing. Yeah. Uh, they can learn. Yeah. And therefore, it's my job to figure out how they learn. So we need to move to a more individualized approach. Okay. It's not about one thing for everybody. Um, and there's ways to create neurodiverse learning experiences in the classroom, whether you do project learning or by shifting from one row of all the students to working in projects. But um, ideally, what we want to do is sort of say, where are you at at a baseline in your learning? Mm -hmm. And what do I need to start with you as a student, knowing that what I do with you as a student is probably good for all the students. Mm -hmm. And uh, But it needs to be a more individualized approach. It has to work on, am I preparing the student to learn by giving, making sure they understand the strengths they have yeah. in order to learn? Yeah. Research is showing us is that there's soft skills right. kids need to learn. Right. And it's more indicative of future success than a child's IQ, Anything their socioeconomic else, yeah. status, et cetera. Right. So, it's not about adding to a teacher's workload. It's just saying, when you're doing math or teaching right. math, why aren't you incorporating things that are critical thinking, reflecting, problem solving? Right. When you're reading an English literature book, why aren't you talking about empathy, mm -hmm. uh, generosity, concepts like that? But by d introducing kids to those experiences, then they need to experience it at the school. Okay. Do I have an opportunity to be empathetic? Do I have an opportunity to use problem solving? You know, Because right that gets into the brain science. Yeah. I can know something. But if my brain actually isn't given permission to write the neural pathway of what it means to be a problem solver, right. then I won't draw upon it. Yeah, I, you don't even really know how yeah. at that level. So, you know, in the past, I've heard you talk, uh, Dr. Wayne, a lot about mindsets. And um, I think most people listening to this podcast would probably be aware of some of the work of uh, Dr. Carol Dweck, which is great work on, you know, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. I've noticed in, in, in some of the things I've heard you talk about, it's, it, you know, you, you break it down a little bit more specifically into four types of mindsets. Yeah. Would you mind just talking us through those? Because I think I, I have found that to be such a powerful lens to help people understand themselves. And I think that part of uh, emotional intelligence is knowing, like, what mindset do I have right now? Is that mindset helping me? Right. How can I move it in a more a positive direction? So maybe talk us through that. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. That <clears throat> the whole idea of growth mindset versus fixed mind, Carol Dweck's work, um, we it's actually not a new concept. Actually, in education, we used to call it effort-based learning. Okay. And uh, but she, what she did is she kind of brought it to the neural science level, where we could actually measure the patterns, or brain activity of children when they were learning. Okay. And so what she did is she said, uh, let's give kids something that they can solve easily. Mm -hmm versus kids who might get something that's more challenging. There's a risk they might make a mistake or they might not get it. Mm -hmm. And what we found was is that if it's easy to solve, there's no brain activity. Okay. <laughs> Literally, there's no learning happening. Right. Because you're just repeating something you already know. Whereas what happened with the other is that when they were introduced to something they could make a mistake at, or they had that, that stretched the brain, therefore the brain just lit up like a Christmas tree. Okay. And we were now trying to access parts of our brain that we never did before. But the idea that you're just growth versus fixed yeah. is too polarized. And so when I looked at it, it was more of a developmental process. So I, I have a, we have a questionnaire that assesses people's uh, degree of flourishing and resilience. Mm -hmm. um, but you also get an idea of where their mindset's at. And okay. so there's four mindsets that I kind of concluded with. One is the surviving mindset. Mm -hmm. These are students that are coming to school, and because of their current circumstances or lived experience, they're just trying to get through the day. Right. They're emotionally sensitive. They tend to be reactive. That brain part of that, it's, it gets triggered, and then all of a sudden they move into defense mode or they pull into themselves, and it's easy to trigger. Okay. Once a child gets triggered on that, you lose them for the next six hours. So if wow. they come to school and a teacher's continually trying to manage their behavior, mm -hmm. when that gets triggered, you've lost them. Yeah. And so if they have that mindset, then it, it gives you an indication, I may need to engage this student differently than the rest of the students okay. at that time. So they need to have a place where they can actually regulate, where they can actually have somebody come alongside and say, hey, I get it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm here. We are going to be safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about we just spend some time doing some things that you're comfortable with? Then you got the protecting mindset. And these are students that have had some life experiences that have taught them, hey, I can get hurt. 
Therefore, I'm not just going to trust you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, a lot of teachers come into the classroom and expect the children, you should all sit in a certain way, behave a certain way, you should trust me. Well, not with these two first two mindsets. That's, that's not where that child's coming from. Right. And so you have to earn it. So what does it mean for you to come alongside and say, hey, I really like you being in the classroom? High-fiving the child when he walks through the doorway, saying, I'm just glad you're here today because we wouldn't have the success without you. It's letting the child know that you really value their presence and that you're not going to judge them by, hey, you acted a perfect way today. Right on. And so it's giving children permission to be real with their emotions. <clears throat> then there's the striving mindset. And then these are the students that actually do well on the surface. Mm -hmm. you know, they get good marks, behave well. But one of their challenges is they don't know how to step out of their comfort zone. Okay. They don't like trying anything that actually would set them up to fail because they're so concerned about how other people are thinking about them. Right. And so the goal in that case there is to say, hey, you're amazing at this, but let's try it here. Right let's on. try it over here. So you're continually stretching them out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And then you got your thrivers. Hey, th those are the kids that say, hey, don't worry about it. I got this. Right. You know, they already know what it means to make mistakes, learn from it. They actually are very excited when they try things they've never done before. But they also reflect an attitude of, I want to be part of something bigger than who I am. Right. They want to be part of some amazing things happening in the school a gifting program to kids that's just anonymous or they're helping you know seniors in the community by going out right. they love to be part of that so ultimately kids come with these mindsets and sometimes it's a fluid you know mm -hmm. you might have a kid that's a striver and all of a sudden something happened at home loss of a pet marriage breakup and they will move into survival mode for a period of time mm -hmm. so we have a way to teach teachers how to identify those mindsets in the classroom very quickly okay. and then what's the strategy you have to connect with the child okay well, that's just great. And, and, you know, what's so nice about this is it's not, uh, you know, a genetic sort of trait whereby you're born like this and you're stuck forever. Yeah. We can shift that mindset and neuroplasticity teaches us that, right? Right. So what is, uh, what's exciting for you? Like, what are some of the projects you're working on right now? And what are you, uh, what are you feeling uh, or thinking about when it comes to the future, 2024, all of that? Yeah, it's a it's 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 a it's an interesting journey forward. Uh, we're doing a lot of work in schools now in um, Canada, United States, uh, New Zealand, Australia, England. Okay, because um, I think a lot of educational systems are realizing that there needs to be a better way to do this. Okay, and then also, how do we monitor it? How do we know what the pathway forward is? So I'm more, I'm really interested in not so much kids. Aha, I've arrived. I'm doing it right. Right. As opposed to, are they progressing? Okay. In their ability to thrive. Right. And, uh, and so a lot of my work now is helping school boards and individual schools to sort of say, what's the culture of our school? Because what, okay. are, what's it like for kids when they walk through the door? Right. How do we support the staff to shift their mindset mm -hmm. to being more relational in the classroom, mm -hmm. developing rituals, habits of connectivity, hmm. uh, and then connecting with the parents so that the parents feel like, oh, the, the school's doing this and I can also support them at home. Nice. Doing it. So it's a kind of a wraparound model more so. And, uh, and one of the projects I'm doing right now is with First Nation schools. Okay. Um, the, the province has sort of sponsored this project, so we're calling nice. it Reimagining Education. Awesome. And uh, it's really fascinating because 85% of my work is not with the students, it's with the teachers. Right. You know, when the kids come through the door, do they like being there? Do they like going to the classroom? But we're starting to see the results. We're into our second year. Wow. Um, we've actually had an increase of 60 students population-wise coming from other communities wow. because they're now hearing through the grapevine, hey, this is a school where you get to do things. Yeah. Uh, we're moving to programs where we're actually identifying the spark of the child in their elementary years, going nice. up into junior high, nice. and they can now go into programs where they actually get certified in a trade by grade 12. Awesome. So we're now making it practical yeah. for many of those kids. Now, if they want to go on to university and be a doctor, awesome. We're yeah. going to do that too. We'll Absolutely. take you there and show you it. Absolutely. But we also found with the parents, because, you know, there's just been that history of the residential schools and how parents have sort of seen themselves as not being able to be involved. Yeah. And so what we found was uh, the parents, the kids are going home and telling a different story. Wow. So we had a parent-teacher interview just the other day, and we had uh, the previous year we had zero. <laughs> and this year we had over 85 parents there. Oh, that's so so they're coming, and they're seeing something different. And uh, so, yeah, so we're... we're, we're just in the process, we're going to document it and hopefully share that with other communities. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to get into the, and you know, and uh, along with you and that whole realm of coaching, I think coaching is a big industry, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the fastest growing industry out there. We know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the quality, right. 
the purpose of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm really excited and the tools, about right? our future work around how, what does it mean to actually train people hmm. to actually facilitate a process that's about building people from the inside out, not trying to solve their problems. Right. And uh, because people can only solve their own issues, but we need to prepare them to know how to do that, right? Absolutely. And then you celebrate the success. And it's not because you were an amazing coach. It's just that this person responded to you, got it, and is now transferring that to other aspects of their lives. Um, we're seeing a big shift in corporate. I was on the plane the other day and I was talking to a lady in the HR department of a high-tech company. And I explained in 10 minutes, she says, okay, we're going to do it. Nice. You know, because she realized that a lot of companies now are starting to realize that maybe their greatest asset isn't so much the product they're selling, yeah. but their staff who actually create the product. So true. And so if we give a way for the staff to discover who am I, what's my sense of vision, and how do I align my strengths to the vision of the organization, yep. I'm going to create things with others that's going to be sellable mm -hmm. and be meaningful to a whole new client base. Out there. Awesome. So they're, they're, they're figuring that out. I think the CEO at that point there was saying, well, I'm just going to let everybody take as many holidays as they want. And I said, that's our recipe for disaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of tying into human nature of, hey, if I can take a break, I'll take a long one. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, you know, thank you for, for sharing. And, and how would uh, somebody get a hold of you who's listening to this, maybe in education or in a corporate environment or a nonprofit and thinking, boy, I'd love to get some flourishing in, in, in my, my zone here. Yeah, like right now, the best thing to do is just email me at wayne at flourishinglife.com. Yep. I just got finished doing a series of videos that we're going to now build a site. Okay. That's a little bit more diverse in the sense of if you're interested in education, this is where you go. Or if you're interested in personal development or yep. leadership development. Uh, but right now, I'm, I'm really interested in connecting with people and hearing their story. Okay. What, what is it that maybe is a need that they're interested in? Mm -hmm. And therefore, how can I connect the dots for them? So they see it as meaningful an outcome. Okay, so that's Wayne at flourishinglife.com. And I know flourishinglife.com is your, your website, your company, and the people that you're working with. And, uh, you know, I will say this, that uh, it's been a, a real pleasure, Dr. Wayne, getting to know you and just appreciating your integrity and the way that you operate. It's really helped shape me. I think when you were mentioning just a moment ago about coaching, I do agree it's fast-growing. The one challenge with a lot of coaches is they don't have a lot of the neuroscience tools and, 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 and so there's a quality gap. Mm. And oftentimes we do find ourselves as coaches stepping into problem solving. Uh, we kind of get into more of a consulting role. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you how to do it, how to fix your life. And, you know, that's, that's easy, yeah. but that's basically Google, right? And uh, why would you pay for that? Whereas right. as a coach, if I can facilitate an experience of, of growth and support you on that journey, right. it's, it's, a, it's a whole different thing. Yeah. And now I've given my client a set of tools that will carry them forward, right? Yeah, yeah it's all that key of tying knowledge to experience. But for coaches, they have to experience it first. Right. You can't give away anything you're not experiencing. Right. Or then you're just teaching a knowledge. Right. And that, I think that's the key is what you do so well is you help coaches to realize you're actually on your own journey. Mm. And it's from that journey you start to develop your sense of how do I treat people, how do I engage them, and what that might look for them because you've done it yourself. Right on. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Wayne. Any, any final thoughts to offer anyone here today? Yeah, I think... Um, you know, if I, if I take a look at whether it's education or people, uh, parents, uh, corporate, professional development, we live in a world that sort of says, this is what you need to do to be successful. You need to step out of that thinking. I think you need to sort of say, what is it that's important to me? Where, where is my passion? Like, what do I get excited about in life? And that really ties to your sense of purpose, which really guides you forward. But then how do I create that skill base? How do I develop those protective factors, the resilience, the performance skills that allow me then to step out into things I normally wouldn't have done and actually see fear as an indicator that that's probably something I should try because it's the right thing to do. may not want to do it, but that's called courage. Right on. And uh, yeah, so I think the goal of life is to flourish and, uh, that, and, and that, that's a journey. Right on. It is a journey and it's one that... Uh, it, that takes a lot of courage, right? It's it's easy easier, I think, to languish than it is to flourish, yeah. and we have to make that decision each and every day. Well, Absolutely. thank you, uh, Dr. Wayne, for 
taking some time with us today and awesome. for being who you are and many contributions that you're making. And without a doubt, friends, uh, we're so grateful that you've tuned in. Check out Dr. Wayne, his website, flourishinglife.com. You can also reach him directly, Wayne, at flourishinglife.com. And uh, please do continue to follow us every episode. We hope to give you something that's meaningful, something that's impactful, and something that builds you for good. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>